Good morning, everybody. <laughs> Welcome to uh, Breakfast Club episode 38, um, which was really about three months in the making because today's guest is uh, in very high demand. Um, we are welcoming Dr. Don Wright, also known as Deep Sea Don. Uh, Dr. Wright, thank you so much for being here. Oh, thank you so much, Laurel. It's a great pleasure to be here. Oh, for us as well. Um, and before we get started, I just wanted to take a second to say wherever you are in the world, um, we are wishing you safety and sanity and general well-being. Um, and thank you so much for deciding to spend some time with us today. Uh, we really appreciate it. Uh, so, Dr. Wright, you have a notoriously um, impressive CV. You are a geographer, an oceanographer, a deep sea explorer, a teacher, uh, an academy fellow, a widely published author, a uh, chief scientist of the Environmental Systems Research Institute, and so much more. Um, but all of that is really uh, centered by the fact that you are a renowned expert in what's called um, geographic information systems or GIS. So um, I figure you must do this all the time. Can you, um, how do you actually explain to lay people what GIS is and why it's so incredible? Well, I usually explain GIS as uh, smart maps uh, sometimes we refer to them as maps on, uh, on good drugs, good steroids, because it's not just the map that you're seeing, it's the map in a computer, and the map is run by all kinds of wonderful numerical recipes behind the scenes. So there are all kinds of calculations that are going on behind those scenes to let you see the map in different ways. The map changes, it morphs, uh, it can tell time. Uh, it, it can make predictions. Uh, it can show you what's going on right now. So one of the biggest, most popular ways of mapping right now is how we're mapping the arrival of Hurricane Sally mm -hmm. in the, at the Gulf Coast. And certainly for us on the West Coast, it's what's happening with the fires, uh, where there are flare-ups, what, what is the extent of the fire, uh, where am I in danger, uh, when do I need to evacuate, uh, all of that is almost up to the minute. So uh, all of that is powered by the geographic information systems that's behind it. Mm -hmm. And I, I took a look at your um, your blog or your the page, your Esri. Is Esri the way to say the acronym correctly? Yes, you, well, you can okay. say uh, Esri, you can say ESRI. Okay. Uh, that's, e either way is fine. Okay, perfect. It is technically an acronym. Okay, perfect. Um, <laughs> Well, your page on their website has uh, just recent blogs, and it's a really amazing way at a glance to see just how why how like just the myriad ways that this technology can be applied and all the different kinds of questions it can answer. Um, so I'll drop a link in there as well. But I wanted to read that, or I'll drop a, drop a link in comments, so sorry, as well. Um, but I wanted to kind of read that list of titles and um, accomplishments in part just because the body of work is so incredible, but also um, it's interesting because that could actually be kind of intimidating for non-scientists or for scientists who are just getting started. So I wanted to ask how you as a human being got started yourself. You know, did you, um, was there a particular aspect of the work or of the world that you kind of fell in love with first? Did you always know you wanted to be a scientist? Oh yes, that, that question is easy. <laughs> I always knew that I wanted to be a scientist. I did not get into GIS until uh, my doctoral degree. Okay. So that part of the story, I think, has the, uh, the encouragement that you can get into mapping at any phase of your, of your life. And, and it's, it's easier now than ever to pick up on, on the technology and do amazing things with it. But I grew up in the Hawaiian Islands and spent half of my childhood in bare feet uh, swinging from banyan trees and swimming in the ocean and exploring, collecting rocks. Uh, so I, I knew uh, very early on that I wanted to to be a scientist and to be an ocean scientist. So uh, so that was very very easy, very easy decision. <laughs> oh, excellent! Well, I can't wait to hear more in the, your talk, and I'll let you just get started with it. Um, but viewers, a reminder as always: you can ask Don questions at any point. Just leave them in the comments section if you're watching on Facebook. Um, and in the chat box if you're watching on YouTube, and we will loop back and ask as many of those as we can at the end. Um, Dr. Wright, if you want to go ahead and share your uh, okay. presentation, we'll throw that up on screen. And uh, one question that people may have is, who is that furry creature behind <laughs> me? That is, <laughs> that is Riley, the golden retriever, one of uh, Esri's many mascots. Uh, she's three years old, and she's my scientific assistant. <laughs> but I'm going to go ahead and share my screen now. And she likes dry. She likes 
walk by introductions, but yes, not she introductions. <laughs> yes. <laughs> okay, perfect. I see this. So I'll add okay. that on. And I will get out of here and we'll see you at the end. Thank you so much again. Okay. Well, thank you so much, Laurel. I really appreciate that that lovely introduction and the uh, the quick Q&A uh, right off the bat. And I'm looking forward to more Q&A afterwards. But I wanted to take some time to talk about uh, GIS. And oftentimes now we're calling it uh, a science. Uh, there is such a thing as geographic information science or uh, geospatial or spatial data science. It's basically the science behind the systems, the science behind the software, the science behind the maps. And at Esri, we have a tagline that we use, which is called the science of where. So that's what my presentation is entitled. And this is not uh, something that Esri uh, has uh, uh, full, uh, the, we are all doing the science of where in various ways. If we are curious about the world, especially because the world has so many problems. You know, we, all you have to do is read the uh, headlines, walk out your front door, especially if you're on the West Coast right now. We are uh, shown environmental degradation, social instability. Uh, there's so much that's happening now with, with uh, the COVID-19 pandemic continues on. We are all aware of racial injustice. That is a spatial problem as well all kinds of challenges in terms of water, pollution, uh, the loss of nature, the loss of biodiversity, of course, the climate crisis, uh, the challenges of overpopulation, all of these are essentially spatial problems. Where is uh, are all of these conditions occurring? So this is part of, of the science of where. And so addressing these issues uh, is part of what the science of where uh, seeks to to solve. And one of the first things that we need to, uh, to do if we're going to solve these problems, especially in a spatial way, is to organize the world's geographic knowledge. This, in a sense, transforms how we see the world, especially through maps. But there are also analytic models. There are uh, different kinds of powerful data sets. There are workflows. Uh, again, the idea of a recipe, you do this with this ingredient and you string those together and then you get some type of, of analytical answer. Uh, there's usually a map or a visualization at the end of that process. There are stories that we're telling now with our data, with our maps, with our geographic analysis. And many of these stories are also told in infographic or dashboard form. We've seen this with COVID-19 so much now because the famous Johns Hopkins dashboard is giving us the most powerful picture uh, of the pandemic all the way from a global view down to what's happening in our own community. So this creates what we sometimes call a building, building blocks of understanding. We're piecing the pictures, we're piecing things together as we're trying to understand our world and as we're trying to solve these problems. It certainly doesn't hurt to have a powerful visualization as well, especially now that we have this synoptic overall view uh, of the planet. Uh, so we have very powerful uh, data sets that we can bring to bear and put them in these beautiful visualizations. So what you're seeing here is tree cover loss uh, in purple, along with tree cover gain, along with population density uh, in the white dots imprinted. So we can see one of the ways that our world is in trouble in terms of the loss of forests and all of the ecosystem services, all of the wonderful things that forests bring to us that uh, is being lost on a global scale. And we've done this with a very powerful geographic uh, visualization. In terms of also uh, seeing, seeing precedes uh, understanding, understanding precedes action. And in the end, I think we're all here because we want to take action in various ways. Uh, those of you in the audience who are interested in the California Academy of Science, science is one of the wonderful things uh, about Cal Academy is how it uh, inspires us to take action, to take better care of our world. We often need to provide a process and a framework uh, for that 
uh, action. And in terms of the science of wear, this is a diagram that shows sort of a virtuous circle of how that's done. We measure things, we visualize and map them. We're doing analysis and modeling. We may need to plan or design, especially if we're looking for places that need protection. We make some type of decision and then we, we take action. One of the things that we do when we take action also is to share, share widely and share openly what it is that we found. So that's part of part of this uh, science of where. And the exciting thing to me and to my colleagues at Esri, and certainly to, to others who work with uh, GIS or technology, information technology, is that there is now this infrastructure that's out there that we can draw from. You're using an infrastructure right now through this webinar because you're using your web browser to access uh, this presentation. And you can also use your web browser uh, to access uh, data, uh, services. Uh, we, can, we can track things, uh, certainly through our phones as well, our phones and our tablets. Uh, so they're all kind this, this, this diagram, uh, we can look at it later and I'll share these slides, but there is uh, this network or this nervous system of uh, content or data and things that we can do with the content, uh, the capabilities. So that is also a very important part of the science of where as well. And then perhaps the most important part of this is you and me, those of us who are scientists, citizen scientists, conservationists, uh, politicians, uh, people from all walks of life, but I'm focusing here on science and conservation since this is a, a Cal Academy uh, presentation. We are all applying the science of where in some way, shape or form, and we're doing it everywhere. And there are all kinds of wonderful projects uh, that are out there. I'll talk about a few of them. We're all becoming more interconnected because we're able to share. We're sharing our data. We're creating apps and sharing those apps. Uh, and ultimately we are sharing and creating knowledge. So this brings me to uh, where I come in, in terms of my role at Esri, I thought you'd like to hear a little bit about that because what in the world is a chief scientist, especially a chief scientist in a software company like Esri? My job is, is really very cool. My role is to strengthen the base of science that we create the software for at Esri. So uh, I'm not involved in sales or marketing or even software development directly. I serve as a scientific subject matter expert to the various teams at Esri, helping them to uh, create better apps and uh, better uh, analysis algorithms, uh, better perspectives that can serve uh, the scientific users uh, of our software. And this is in many, many different areas. And there is a, a little URL up at the top right. So Laurel might want to put that uh, in the chat if she hasn't already, so that you can see our portfolio of projects and uh, partners. And we right now we're doing the best in these sciences that you see, uh, weather and climate science, hydrology, geology and geophysics, ecology, agricultural science, forestry, which is really uh, coming to the fore now, especially with uh, the fire modeling and mapping uh, that's going on, conservation biology, sustainability science, which also gets into many of the social sciences, including uh, using technology for, for racial uh, justice, uh, using technology for public health, including the COVID-19 mapping that's going on, ocean science, and then the more traditional uh, cartographic sciences, computer science, uh, working with remotely sensed images. All of that is, is going on right now. Uh, and it's quite uh, an amazing time to be working with this technology. It's an amazing time to be at a company like Esri that really is committed to and cares uh, for these different ways of knowing and for these different uh, areas of investigation. And this is one of the ways that we are expressing that through our living Atlas of the World, which is a huge 
global GIS. It's one of the world's largest catalogs of, of data uh, and also of, of apps and uh, of other types of resources. My colleagues have put together this indicators of the planet. So this is, I, I tend to think of it as the mother of all dashboards because it's giving you live feeds, live indications of all of these indicators of the health or lack thereof of our planet, including air quality. So today's air quality in various parts of the world, what's going on with wildfire, what's happening with COVID-19, what's happening with hurricanes or cyclones, sea level rise, uh, even piracy on the high seas. So this is one of the, the ways that we are expressing at a glance what's happening with the planet. This is being done in collaboration with Microsoft and with uh, National Geographic and many, many of our uh, scientific partners. And we have several initiatives, several programs where we are building a series of apps and data resources uh, and other, uh, other spatial uh, treasure gems so that people can uh, support drought and fire and be resilient there. We, are, well, we have an initiative that's supporting uh, urban heat resilience, lots of sea level rise viewers and calculators. Flooding is a, a common, uh, unfortunately, a common uh, problem, especially with the changes that are taking place on our planet due to, due to climate change. So these are some of the areas uh, that we are working very intensely in right now uh, at ESRI and with our partners. And speaking of our partners, we're doing quite a bit in conservation data science. So we are very glad to be in collaboration or in communication with Cal Academy and hope to develop a closer partnership with them. It goes also along with the Society for Conservation, GIS, uh, which has many members uh, in the Bay Area and many members who participate in Cal Academy's programs. We've been working with E.O. Wilson, the father of biodiversity on his uh, Half Earth Initiative so he, E.O. Wilson has a biodiversity uh, foundation. And right now we're working uh, with that foundation and also with colleagues at Yale University contributing to a global geospatial infrastructure for literally saving uh, at least half of the Earth's biodiversity. And this is on land and in the ocean as well. We work quite a bit with NatureServe, which is a wonderful spinoff of the Nature Conservancy. And for the last couple of years, uh, we've been helping them to develop a map of biodiversity importance. So this is an effort to identify not only where different types of species are, but where are the, the species that are most at risk and what should we do to conserve those at risk species. So the map of biodiversity importance is a wonderful example uh, of a map that's colorful, that's informative, but uh, but has a whole lot going on, especially in terms of machine learning uh, algorithms and using those algorithms on uh, data that we now have at the most detailed uh, resolution so that we can identify places that matter the most for sustaining uh, the biodiversity uh, of our country. This is a US-based effort. And the map of biodiversity importance has already found that for most of us, there is a species of plant or animal that is at risk, probably within 30 miles or so of where, of where we live. And so if you go to the map of biodiversity importance, you can learn much, much more about that. And what you're seeing here are uh, images from a terrific story map that they have put together to tell you the story of this, of this effort. You may have heard also of the Jack and Laura Dangerman Preserve. This is a wonderful uh, effort that was started by the purchase of 24,000 uh, acres of undeveloped, some of the wildest, uh, precious land in California that was set aside. It was purchased by Jack and Laura Dangerman, who are the founders of Esri, and then they ceded that land over to the Nature Conservancy, which is now managing this amazing preserve. That includes eight miles of undeveloped coastline, 
native grasslands, shrubs, woodlands, uh, some amazing oaks, uh, over 50 endangered plant and animal species. So this is something that has uh, just started. It's been a few years now in the making. This is a map uh, of the Jack and Laura Dangerman Preserve. It is not yet open to the public. And it's actually going to be a place where there are all kinds of amazing activities that will occur in terms of conservation uh, data science, uh, conservation management. We are creating a digital twin of the landscape using LIDAR and a whole series of environmental sensors, drones. Uh, this is work that's going on right now by the Nature Conservancy in collaboration with UC Santa Barbara and with us, and there'll be many, many other partners that are involved in this. And the idea is to apply science and technology for conservation and to learn about this using the Dangerman Preserve as the, the natural laboratory so that we can improve the way that we designate and protect uh, areas, so protected area management research, looking at connectivity, uh, landscape connectivity uh, between uh, different species, uh, mobile uh, uh, mammal species especially, certainly looking at the effects of, of climate change uh, in this last great wild place uh, in California. There will hopefully be quite a bit of research that students and citizen scientists can conduct at some point, but the idea is to return this wonderful 24,000 uh, acre piece of treasure back to uh, its pristine state as as closely as possible as we can as we can achieve that. It used to be the Bixby Ranch, so uh, there's a lot of uh, restoration uh, that's going on on the property right now but that's a really exciting project. And then I understand that you, you wanted to hear uh, a little bit about some, some adventures at sea, uh, some of the things that, that, I've been, that I've been up to, and certainly uh, some of the things that we're doing at Esri in terms of, of mapping the ocean. Some of that is happening in conjunction with the Dangerman Preserve and with some of the other activities that I've touched on. But this is uh, one picture of some of my first adventures uh, at sea as an oceanographer and uh, diving to the ocean floor first in the Alvin submersible in the early 1990s. I'm going to stop sharing my screen and go to, to me again because I also wanted to share my love of Legos. So what you're seeing here is a, a model of, it's not the Alvin submersible, but it's one in a similar class. It's the Japanese Shinkai 6500 diving on a Lego hydrothermal vent or hot spring on the ocean floor. And there are a whole bunch of Lego uh, models behind me. It's sort of a sort of a hobby. And this is another favorite model. It's, an, it's a research vessel, an oceanographic research vessel with uh, a submersible uh, in the back that's about to be launched. And the minifigure in that submersible is uh, Sylvia Earle. <laughs> <laughs> who many of you know. Let me go back to sharing my screen. Hope that this will work again. So this is one of the uh, amazing things that we are doing at Esri with global uh, ocean data is that we are working on uh, an ocean base map. A base map is something that you can underlay and put your own data on top of. And so this has been going on since 2011. Uh, we have been building this mainly in collaboration with the general bathymetric chart of the oceans and NOAA and many other uh, institutions. And you can see that this is a beautiful map. One of the reasons why it's beautiful is because we consider ourselves to be a uh, keeping up with the modern legacy of Marie Tharp. Sorry, just taking a drink of water here. Marie is, uh, if you don't know the story of Marie Tharp, I would highly recommend the book Soundings by Hallie Felt. Marie actually invented marine cartography or ocean cartography. And this particular map follows some of her uh, techniques, her legacy, in terms of its design, the colors, the color saturation, 
the shading, uh, all of this is, is part of what makes this map uh, amazing and useful. You can access it for free, especially within the uh, Esri Living Atlas of the World. And in terms of how you can put other data on top of this base map, these uh, red dots here show all of the places where I've been to see uh, over, over my career, including places where we've crossed the equator. And I've served as Davy Jones in some pretty uh, <laughs> crazy equator crossing uh, proceedings to welcome those who have not crossed the equator before into the realm of shellbacks, those who are worthy. We also at Esri uh, make a whole series of polar base maps. This is particularly important uh, given that you need a special stereographic projection in order to uh, understand spatial relationships and to look at things properly at the North Pole and at the South Pole. And this is all in addition to the authoritative data from the community in these regions, including many organizations that are focused just on mapping uh, areas in the Arctic and the Antarctic. And then there is the special, uh, it's a projected reference system that our mathematicians and our cartographers have just come up with, which shows you the entire ocean as one ocean. This idea of showing the ocean in this way was made popular by an amazing scientist named Athelstan Spielhaus in 1979, but the equations and the methods behind this map were never exposed. That is until our cartographic wizards at Esri developed the math that's necessary to create this kind of map in the Adam Square 2 projection. And so now this particular map is available uh, in our software. And we think the timing of this is particularly uh, perfect given that the United Nations is going into the ocean decade, the decade of ocean science for sustainable development, which starts next year. And we need to look at the ocean as one body especially as we, as human beings, are really one people. And we, we're doing all kinds of fun things with this new map, including showing the locations of all of the hydrothermal vents uh, in the world in this one ocean framework, as well as all of the areas that are uh, protected by marine protected areas and reserves. This is a beautiful one that shows the geomorphology of the seafloor, including the uh, mid-ocean ridge that you can see in the bright yellow, which is where there's volcanic activity. This is where the hot springs are that we usually dive on in submersibles like Alvin, places where there are giant faults that uh, shift and cause tsunamis. All of these geomorphology features are depicted in this way. We're also doing quite a bit more now uh, with uh, shading and uh, other cartographic uh, techniques to bring out the seafloor and also the life in the oceans much more dramatically. This is showing you uh, the Mid-Atlantic Ridge, the Atlantic seafloor, along with the color codes that show you all of the different features, the rises, the ridges, the basins, uh, the trenches. Uh, that are used in this uh, special this special legend. And then we have these apps that bring you face to face with the latest data so that you can see in this case the extent and the regression of Arctic sea ice and uh, Antarctic sea ice. These are apps that you can access on the web uh, for free within the living atlas uh, of the world that Esri uses. We are that Esri has created, and we're involved in several partnerships where the ocean is concerned as well, such as Seabed 2030, which exists to create a detailed map uh, of the ocean, especially of the ocean floor by 2030. We do not have that yet. We only have about 15% of the ocean floor mapped at the same resolution that we have maps of land. And we do quite a bit of, of writing uh, on that, including what we've been doing with uh, the various technologies to the ocean 
and uh, partners such as the uh, Ocean Discovery X Prize, and most recently with Scripps Institution of Oceanography. One of the things that's been really exciting is the creation of a 3D digital base map of the ocean. So I show, showed you the ocean base map before. This is the ocean base map in 2D as well as in 3D. So we call this the ecological uh, marine units. And we also are working now on ecological coastal units to get this 3D visualization of ocean salinity, temperature, oxygen, and nutrients. So this has been uh, something that's been a labor of love for several of us over the past few years. It now exists as a web app or as an app that you can explore on your phone or your tablet. And we've been publishing uh, this work in journals such as Oceanography and Nature. And we have groups all over the world that are uh, using this base map and uh, the 3D data in different, in different ways. So this is uh, from a poster that shows the locations where some of these use cases are taking place uh, using the ecological marine units for marine protected area designation or looking at uh, species uh, distribution, uh, looking at how uh, ocean conditions are improving or declining in different parts of the ocean, all using our, our 3D volumetric data. So, let me look at my clock here. And uh, I've wrapped up in about uh, half an hour. I didn't want to go on too long so that you would have time for, for questions and discussion. So, so that's a, a whirlwind tour of the science of where and some of the projects that we're doing and some of the specific uh, ocean work that I've been involved in. This is how you can get a hold of me on email or social media. And uh, there is the URL to our science portfolio, but also to a new book that we've just released about GIS for science. So with that, I will stop sharing and go back to, to real life here. <laughs> <laughs> to real life. <laughs> Hello. Yeah, that was, um, that was incredible. The, the, um, the range of applications, again, is just mind blowing. Not surprisingly, though, our first question is um, about going down in a sub. And it's from Daniel, age 10, who asks, what is it like to go very deep in a submarine? And do you ever get scared? It is an amazing uh, experience. Uh, it's so we, especially with SpaceX uh, sending astronauts to the to the space station, and I hope everybody saw that. That was absolutely amazing. the uh, The experience of going down into the ocean is not as dramatic as that. It's certainly uh, more tranquil because you're just descending very quietly. But for me, it it has the uh, a similar excitement factor because it's not outer space; it's inner space. And especially where I've been on dives in the Pacific, you descend very slowly and quietly through the water, through the lighted zone, the euphotic zone in the ocean where, where the sun is penetrating, light is penetrating and you can see. And then it very uh, gradually gets gray and then pitch black dark. Now, in terms of being scared, uh, it, it's not for me, it wasn't frightening at all because these submersibles, for instance, uh, Alvin uh, has a titanium, it's a, a, a personnel sphere made out of titanium. So it's resistant to pressure. You don't have to worry about anything. You, uh, I went down uh, in, uh, on my dive wearing a t-shirt and uh, sweatpants. Uh, no special suit is needed. And you're with very experienced personnel who are, who are guiding you in the sub. But the most amazing experience happened for me once we got into the pitch black depths. There are these creatures called siphonophores, uh, little sea worms, and they have uh, bioluminescent properties. And they were swimming around each other and bumping into each other. So as they were bumping into each other, they were giving off uh, the uh, spray of bioluminescent light. So it was like a little fireworks show as we were slowly descending uh, through the pitch black depth of the ocean. And then when we got to the sea floor, 
the, the pilot turned on the strobe lights or, or the lights so that we could see. And then there was this, all of a sudden, this moon-like landscape appeared before us. And it was as if there was no water. It was as if you could just open up the hatch and uh, step outside. Of course, you can't do that because the pressure at that depth was about two tons per square inch. But it was just a, it's a, it's a wild, wonderful experience. And I, I don't know if I'll get the opportunity to, to do it again, but I, I sure would, would love to. And hopefully you've heard about Kathy Sullivan recently, who became the first American woman to dive to the deepest part of the planet. She went down to Challenger Deep with Victor Vescovo's expedition. And this is significant because she was the first woman to, to do this but she is also the first American woman to walk in space. Mm -hmm. So now she calls herself the most vertical girl in the universe because she's soared higher <laughs> and she's do she's been deeper than, than anyone else. And um, now thanks to, and, and uh, I, I love talking about this, so I don't wanna take up too much of the time, but thanks to Victor Vescovo's uh, expeditions that he has taken recently to Challenger Deep. We now have uh, 12 people, I think, uh, at least 12 people who've been to the deepest part of our planet. And that matches uh, the number of people who have walked on the moon because for about 50 or 60 years, we had sent all of these people to the moon, but we had not sent anyone to the deepest parts of our oceans since 1961 when uh, Jacques Picard and uh, Don Walsh uh, did it in the submersible Trieste. So anyway. <laughs> Yeah, that that's um, you told that so so well. I think we're all gonna dream about it tonight. But also the um, <laughs> your mention of the first woman to to go to the deepest um, place on Earth kind of ties into Michelle's question, which was another question about firsts. She said, "I saw on your Wikipedia that you were the first Black woman to dive in the Alvin submarine. Is that visibility something you think about or intentionally model in your work at all? And any thoughts on how to make data science more diverse?" Oh, that's a very good one. Uh, oh, so I have a Wikipedia page, so that's nice to know. <laughs> you didn't know that? <laughs> I can link you to it if you want. <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> but but yes, uh, that that's what I'm told. That So that picture that I showed you from 1991, that was mm -hmm. my first Alvin dive, and that did make me the first African-American uh, woman to descend uh, to the seafloor, uh, certainly in Alvin. I had the chance to speak to Mae Jemison last year on the phone. Mae Jemison was the first African-American woman to go into space on the space shuttle. It would be one of my childhood heroes. So to have a chance to talk to her, uh, we were talking about a project that that her, her organization and, and Israel might do together. But we were just talking as two scientists, but it occurred, it certainly occurred to me that this is still a, a big deal. I, I wish that it wasn't. I, I wish that we didn't um, didn't have such a lack of diversity. Uh, in fact, Mae Jemison was only recently verified on Twitter, and we were like, "What? <laughs> Ver oh. <laughs> she is a public figure. She is a, a, a national treasure. Verify her account, please." That is yeah. really Mae Jemison. Anyway, uh, certainly with the awakening and the reckoning. Literally, it's a reckoning that we are, are doing now in this country and around the world about diversity, about racial injustice, and it extends to the GIS world, to the data science world, uh, making this, uh, these disciplines attractive to uh, people who are Black, Latina, Indigenous, uh, trans, all these, we need all of these different perspectives in order to innovate. We are never going to innovate until we can bring together all of these different voices and perspectives and ways of thinking. So yes, it's something that I'm thinking about now more than ever. Uh, in fact, there was just a, a Black in Geoscience Week on social media last week, and there's going to be a Black in Marine Science Week later on in the year. There are all kinds of uh, diversity initiatives that are that are going on. It, it's all great. Uh, Esri has a new racial equity and uh, social justice initiative where we're actually building tools and data sets and templates to help uh, communities, especially communities of color, uh, to to do this important uh, mapping work. 
So uh, again, in a word, yes, it's all it's all really prescient now. Um, and it's Black Mammologist Week this week, just by the ah, way, Twitter, right. <laughs> Twitter yeah. people. Um, and there was, so we had several people ask if it was possible to share a list of all the sites and projects that you are mentioning. So yes, Patricia and others, we will go back and drop everything that um, Don has mentioned in the comments later. Thank you. Um, okay, great. So let me see here. We've got so many good questions. I'm going to take, um, I'm going to take Allison's. She asks, who provides the interface between the science and the actual application of that science, such as city planning, for example? That's a very good question, Allison. So the interface can happen in various ways. Sometimes there might be someone in uh, the city's uh, office on their staff who is a GIS specialist or, or a data scientist. So they are the interface uh, between uh, the science and the technology or whatever needs to be done in terms of planning or uh, districting or certainly now in the case of public safety, there's so many public safety offices, uh, emergency management offices, uh, fire departments, uh, police departments that have a GIS specialists. So they can work with the software. They know how to, to use our software. We give them assistance for many organizations. We provide uh, training. So that, that's one way. Another way is we, we actually, it, Esri started as an environmental consulting firm. It didn't start as a software company. It started in 1969 uh, with Jack and Laura Dangerman uh, creating this environmental consulting firm, especially for landscape architecture. And it turned out that uh, the software that they were creating in order to serve those clients became so valuable that the client said, why don't you make this more of this software and distribute it, sell it. So, so that's how Esri became Esri, but Esri still has the original environmental consulting portion of the company. And so we will uh, use that portion. You can hire us to implement all manner of interfaces between science and public policy and our technology. And we will come in and build for you, build all the technology teach you how to use it, get you launched on teaching others in your organization. So that that's another way. And then a third way is, especially with universities and nonprofits, uh, we, we uh, have science teams that will work with, with organizations like that on projects. And we are uh, on the team uh, with the organization and we just do the science together. The organization already has our software, but we use that as an opportunity to push the limits of our software and innovate. We learn from those organizations and those projects so that we can do better and build uh, better software. So it's a two-way street there. Right. Okay, great. Thank you. Um, so here's a geology question. Elise asks, she was curious, is trench a specific geological category of depth, or does it mean something formed in a specific way, or is it a more generic word for something deep? Uh, it's actually all of those things. A trench, a deep ocean trench is uh, a deep place in the ocean, but these trenches form because of plate tectonics. So th these are places where one plate, one big piece of the Earth's surface is diving into the interior of the Earth underneath the other uh, big chunk or big plate. So uh, Challenger Deep that I mentioned where Kathy Sullivan uh, took her dive, that is in the Marianas Trench in the western part of the Pacific. And that's where the Pacific plate is, uh, is diving, literally diving into the interior uh, of the planet and being subsumed, being subducted there uh, underneath uh, that, that part of, of uh, Asia, or really Guam. And so uh, because one chunk of the ocean is so heavy and dense, it uh, creates this very, very deep spot in the ocean. So we have uh, trenches around the circumference of the Pacific Ocean. And you might've heard of the term ring of fire because when you have that type of activity going on, that's where you get the earthquakes and the volcanic eruptions. This is one of the reasons why Japan has to be so careful all the time and they have so many earthquakes because they're right there 
they have the Japan Trench. Uh, places like Hawaii are, are not like that because Hawaii sits in the middle of the Pacific uh, and it it just has uh, volcanoes, <laughs> not as many uh, earthquakes. <laughs> right. How deep is Challenger Deep? Challenger Deep is uh, over 10 kilometers deep, or I say 10 kilometers because many people have run a 10K race, a 10 kilometer okay. race. So, so we know that's six miles. So, so it's over six miles deep. Wow. <laughs> okay. Deep place. <laughs> um, this one's from Lynn. She says, I'm a college freshman and this kind of environmental modeling and prediction is exactly what I want to do. GIS isn't offered at my school. Are there other foundational classes I should focus on in the meantime? I, I would like to know what school you go to because okay. GIS is, um, uh, maybe you can answer in the chat which school you're at because there it may be that it's there, but your uh, class or your department doesn't know that you have access to it because we we essentially give our software away to 11,000 colleges and universities. So I'm surprised that your college doesn't have it. If your college really doesn't have it, we can we can get it for you and we can hook you up with, uh, well, even beyond that, we can work on that. But there is an initiative called Learn uh, GIS, Learn Arc GIS, and you can forge ahead on your own. And we provide the data and the software uh, and uh, all of these fantastic uh, environmental ways to learn about the environment or to learn about society with our software. So you can dive into to learn uh, ArcGIS. So I, I can provide information about that, but I'm, I would be really surprised if your college doesn't, doesn't have GIS. Okay, great. So Lynn, double check, and if not, have them reach out to Esri. Um, and we'll drop a link for ArcGIS in the comments later. Uh, everybody's admiring your shirt, by the way. <laughs> oh, thank you. <laughs> it's a map, a contour map. Yeah. yeah. Very cool. Um, let's see here. So I'm going to ask from Rich, are there any um, specific challenges or problems you think we need to map right now but don't have enough data for? And then the second part of his question is, do you ever put out calls for people to collect specific data for, for these tools? Yes, yeah, so that's happening right now with the ocean. Uh, it says, so that's what Seabed 2030 is all about. You know, the ocean is really, really important. It's not something where if you live in Colorado or you live in Ohio or you live in Nevada, the ocean doesn't matter to you. The ocean is a place where if you breathe, if you take a breath, that is because of the ocean, because the ocean produces about half of the breathable oxygen that we take advantage of on this planet. We would not be doing this call, this webinar without the ocean. We have the internet because of the ocean because internet traffic travels through submarine cables. So we have to know more about the complexity on the sea floor. Mapping in the ocean is very difficult because the sensors that we, we have up to this moment uh, really don't see, they, they can't see through the water. So this is an area where we have been trying to use sound waves instead, acoustics. Mm -hmm. But that's very slow going if you're doing it in detail. So that's where we actually have been uh, crowdsourcing. The Seabed 2030 initiative has been taking advantage of crowdsourcing, even from cruise ships, um, even from fishing boats, anyone who is able to use or deploy sonar equipment and gather some data and add it to, to the map, uh, the global map that is developing. The other part of the ocean that we don't know very much about is what's happening in the water we call this the water column between the sea floor and the sea surface. We have a lot of great maps of the sea surface uh, because we can map that with satellites, but the satellites can't see effectively into the water and give us this uh, beautiful three-dimensional uh, view that we're designing, which, which is why our ecological uh, marine units project has been, we think, a nice step forward. So a lot of that crowdsourcing is happening now. Another part of uh, mapping, we, we do not have enough data in uh, indigenous communities uh, and in uh, communities of color, uh, all of these places where we have all of these societal problems, 
we, we have maps, we have data, but there's a lot that's happening now with uh, communities that are doing uh, their own uh, mapping of their water quality or of uh, uh, the, the environmental conditions that are taking place there. So that's another uh, area, which is why we have this racial equity uh, initiative to uh, get into those sometimes forgotten places uh, of, of society. This is part of what's going on with the census because we're not getting back the, the data uh, from the communities uh, that need to have the census filled out the most. And we don't want those communities to lose out. Right, okay. Um, let me see, do you have, we'll take three more <laughs> and then let you go and then set you free. Um, the, let's see, Jess asked, can you say something about the Cascadia subjection, subject, subduction zone since it's proximal to us here? Yes, the Cascadia subduction zone is uh, another one of these uh, fantastic subduction zones where in that case, you've got the Juan de Fuca plate that's diving underneath the North American plate. That subduction zone is not as deep as uh, the Marianas Trench, uh, for instance, because the Juan de Fuca uh, plate is diving underneath a continent. Mm -hmm. So there's, uh, you might say there's some, some blockage there. So the angle of that subduction is not as steep but it can, it, it is a very, it can be a very active uh, area. And there is a scientist at Oregon State University, uh, Professor Chris Goldfinger, who is one of the authorities on that subduction zone. And when there's likely to be a big, the next big earthquake on that subduction zone. Now, the reason why that is really, really important is because the Cascadia subduction zone is fairly close to the Oregon-Washington uh, border, to that shoreline. So if there is a great earthquake on that subduction zone and a tsunami or tsunami waves are generated to head to the Oregon-Washington coast, there would be very little time to, uh, to get, a, get out of the way of that. So there, and, and, and mapping the seafloor is very important for that too, because once those tsunami waves start to feel the bottom as they get closer to the shore, all of that horizontal energy will be transformed to vertical energy in terms of these big waves that are going to wash up uh, onto the shore. So there are places uh, like Seaside, Oregon, that are fairly flat. And so it'll be very hard to get out of the tsunami waves uh, in time. But Dr. Goldfinger and others have now uh, completed uh, very nice uh, bathymetry uh, of offshore of Oregon and there are efforts offshore of Washington as well. So they're getting a better picture in terms of, of that particular zone and also uh, what the seafloor will do to channel waves that are created from a large earthquake coming from that zone. Mm -hmm. That's remarkable. Um, the, and uh, so Alejandra mm -hmm. asked, um, when you were talking about some of the citizen science projects you mentioned, earlier, is there a way for people to actually um, kind of log on somewhere and see if there are any projects they could contribute to? Mm -hmm. Yes, absolutely. A, a really good one is called Earth Challenge 2020. Mm -hmm. Earth Challenge 2020 is an initiative that was started by the Earth Day Network, along with the Wilson Center, along with the U.S. Department of State. And they launched Earth Challenge 2020 on Earth Day of this year because it, in part, this is a, a big deal because it's the 50th anniversary of Earth Day, but Earth Challenge 2020 continues. So you can go, you can look up Earth Challenge 2020 just on, in a Google search, mm -hmm. or I can share the uh, exact link. And basically with Earth Challenge 2020, there are several research questions like how clean is the water in my neighborhood? What are the different types of insects uh, that are in my area? Uh, how much plastic pollution is around me? So those are your themes or your questions. Earth Challenge 2020 gives you an app that you can load onto your phone and then you can go and map to answer these questions. You can add your data uh, to the global or the regional map that is being compiled. Uh, another one is on earth, uh, on air quality. Mm -hmm. And then there's some neat modules, educational modules that help you to learn about 
what you have just can to how you be the solution. So that's a that's a really good one. I would recommend. Okay, great. And I should, this is Cal Academy, so I should say you know iNaturalist is another fantastic citizen science effort, and the iNaturalist app is evolving all the time because I understand now that when you uh, identify plants or animals in the field, uh, iNaturalist will help you to identify what you're looking at. So that's another great one. <laughs> yeah, that's it's pretty remarkable. Uh, we talk about that a lot, so it's really cool to hear about um, to hear about other ones. Um, I should. Oh, so we've got several people bunching up on this question. It's about Legos. Uh, Coco is admiring <laughs> all the Legos in the background. Emily <laughs> wants to know if the Explorer ship that you showed is an official set, and Shelby wants to know whether they've made you into a Lego yet. <laughs> uh, the answer to all of those is yes. <laughs> uh, <laughs> if you go to my Twitter feed, there at the very top, there is a, a, a Deep Sea Dawn uh, minifigure that was made by a, a colleague of mine who I still have not met, but he he made a, a, a minifigure and he also gave me the pieces so that I could make my own uh, marine GIS lab. Now that is more precious to me than my PhD. <laughs> <laughs> and the uh, the research vessel that isn't that is an official Lego kit. Uh, I can I can tell you down to the kit number what it is. But all of the Legos behind me are uh, official kits that you can get on Lego.com, except for the submersible. This is a very special kit because this was released only in Japan uh, to honor the Shinkai 6500. Uh, this is the Shinkai 6500. That's the submersible, which was the world's first submersible to be able to dive to a depth of 6,500 meters. So you can't really find the, I found this on the Lego black market, so to speak. <laughs> if you can find the kit, it's very, very expensive. Uh, but it was only, only a certain number of them were released and only in Japan. Oh, that's so cool. Um, Okay, great. Well, I'll end with this last one, um, and it's from Jen, and it's kind of a nice, a nice thing to wrap up with. She says or asks, "Do you think that looking at so many different problems from such a big picture view gives you a different perspective on Earth from most people?" Oh, that's a wonderful question to end on. Absolutely, yes. I think uh, just knowing that we can look at these problems. So, for instance, the indicator, the Living Atlas indicator dashboard that I showed, which gives you a glance at many of the world's environmental problems is one way. But there's so many organizations now that are giving us windows into uh, aspects of life on this planet that we never, ever could have imagined. Even in terms of what's going on in Syria uh, with uh, people who are in refugee camps, or what's happening with COVID, just go to so many of these COVID-19 dashboards mm -hmm. that are out there now, and you really get a perspective of what is happening uh, in, in different parts of the world, but certainly in your own community. Uh, if just about every county, every state has a COVID-19 dashboard now, and you can see uh, whether or not uh, your area is getting better or whether it's getting worse. And there, the, the discussion around that could take us to a whole other seminar. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Um, well, if you want to come back and do a whole other seminar, we're, we're here for any time. <laughs> we well, um, I'll, I'll say uh, quickly that uh, I am Esri's chief scientist, but we also have a chief medical officer who is, a, who is an MD. Her name is uh, Dr. S.D. Garrity. And she has been uh, at the forefront uh, of our COVID-19 response as a company. So she gives fantastic uh, seminars on that topic and all the things that we've been doing uh, to, to help there. Okay, that's great to know. We'll reach out to her. Um, I can't thank you enough for making time today. I'm so grateful that you, that was fascinating. I'm so grateful you came on. Um, and Breakfast Club viewers, you can see who's next up on the schedule by going to calacademy.org and searching Breakfast Club anytime. Um, thank you. We'll let you get back to your day. Um, and um, as, like, as I said before, if you do ever want to come back and you have another spare hour, we would love to have you. Thank you so very much. Thank you so much, Laurel and everyone. All right, everyone take care. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.